Boo. Hello, lost souls, and welcome to another midnight story. Let's start this with a blast. What's high in the middle and round on both ends? Ohio. Okay, I'll stick to stories and poems. Before we dive into the stories, please help me create more content by liking and sharing this video. Do tell me, do you watch the video at night or do you save it for daytime? Let me know as I'm very curious on this. Now get comfortable, turn off the lights, and let's start. There was always something unsettling about the attic in the old house I inherited from my grandparents. They had lived there for over 50 years, and the house held many memories, both cherished and eerie. The attic was a place of forbidden curiosity. My grandmother had always warned me never to go up there, claiming it was unsafe. But after her passing, the house became mine, and the secrets it held became my responsibility. On a stormy night, the wind howled through the creaking old windows, and lightning illuminated the corners of every room in sharp, fleeting bursts. Unable to sleep, I found myself staring at the attic door, a wooden trap door in the ceiling of the hallway. The house was filled with an oppressive silence, broken only by the sound of rain tapping against the windows. I felt a pull towards the attic, an inexplicable urge to uncover whatever was hidden away. I fetched a stepladder and, with a deep breath, ascended towards the mysterious entrance. The door was stiff and reluctant, as if it had not been opened in years, but I managed to pry it open. A gust of cold, stale air rushed past me and I shivered, feeling an ominous presence. The attic was pitch dark, and my flashlight struggled to cut through the thick shadows. Dust particles danced in the beam, and the wooden floor groaned under my weight. The air was thick with neglect and something else, something foul. I inched forward, my heart pounding, every creak of the floorboards echoing in the confined space. Boxes upon boxes of forgotten belongings cluttered the attic, and as I sifted through them, I found old photo albums, antique furniture, and strange, unidentifiable trinkets. My flashlight then caught something in the far corner, a figure motionless and hunched over. I froze, my breath caught in my throat. I hesitated then slowly moved the beam of light closer. The figure was a mannequin, its blank face staring back at me, covered in a thick layer of dust. I let out a shaky breath, feeling slightly foolish. But as I turned away, I heard a faint, almost imperceptible whisper. Leave. The word sent a chill down my spine, and I whipped around, but the attic was as still as ever. I dismissed it as my imagination and continued exploring. I reached a large old trunk, its lock broken and its lid slightly ajar. Inside I found a collection of yellowed letters and photographs, depicting my grandparents in their youth. They seemed happy, but as I dug deeper, the images grew darker. My grandmother's expressions became strained, and my grandfather appeared more somber. One letter caught my eye, its paper brittle and its ink faded. It was from my grandmother, addressed to an unknown recipient. As I read, a sense of dread washed over me. To whoever finds this, I must confess the truth. My husband was not the man everyone thought he was. There is a darkness within him, a sickness that drove him to unspeakable acts. He hid them well, but I found out. The attic, the attic holds his secrets. If you are reading this, be warned. Do not linger. Leave before it is too late. The flashlight flickered, casting erratic shadows around the attic. My heartbeat thundered in my ears as I slowly backed away from the trunk. A sudden noise behind me made me spin around, and the flashlight fell from my grasp, plunging the attic into darkness. I fumbled to retrieve it, but the beam was weak, barely illuminating my surroundings. As I raised it, the light fell upon the mannequin again. Only this time, it wasn't where I had left it. It had moved, now standing mere inches from where I knelt. A cold hand clasped my shoulder from behind and a voice, low and malevolent, whispered in my ear. I told you to leave. I spun around, the flashlight shaking in my trembling hand, but there was no one there. My breath came in short, panicked gasps. The attic door was my only escape, but as I turned to flee, the mannequin blocked my path, its lifeless eyes now glistening with a sinister light. The trap door slammed shut above me, and I was plunged into complete darkness. The sound of footsteps approached, slow and deliberate. 
I could hear the faint rustling of fabric and the creak of the floorboards under a heavy weight. Welcome to my home, the voice whispered again, closer this time, almost right behind me. You'll never leave. The attic felt like it was closing in on me. The walls themselves seemed to breathe, pressing closer and closer. I could feel an icy breath on the back of my neck, and then a sharp pain as though something had clawed at me. Panic surged through my veins and I stumbled backwards, tripping over the debris on the floor. In the dim light, I saw shadows flicker, forming shapes that were both human and monstrous. Faces emerged from the darkness, their eyes hollow and accusing. Whispers filled the air, a cacophony of despair and malice. The air grew colder and I could see my breath forming in front of me, mingling with the shadows. The letters and photographs from the trunk fluttered into the air, caught in an invisible whirlwind. They swirled around me, the images of my grandparents' tormented faces blurring together. I tried to make my way to the attic door, but the mannequins, there were more of them now, dozens, blocked my path, their expressions eerily lifelike and filled with malevolence. Why did you come here? They seemed to ask, their silent mouths moving in unison. Why didn't you listen? The voice, now a guttural growl, echoed through the attic. You should have stayed away. I was almost to the door when something cold and clammy wrapped around my ankle, pulling me back. I fell, my head striking the floor, stars exploding in my vision. Dazed, I looked up to see a shadowy figure looming over me, its form shifting and undulating like smoke. You belong to us now, it hissed. Desperation gave me strength, and I kicked free, scrambling towards the trapdoor. I reached up, my fingers just grazing the edge. But as I pulled myself up, I felt a hand, no, multiple hands, grabbing at me, dragging me back into the darkness. Help, I screamed, but my voice was swallowed by the oppressive blackness. The flashlight flickered one last time, revealing the grinning faces of the mannequins, now impossibly close. Suddenly the flashlight burst into life, illuminating a gruesome scene. The attic was filled with more mannequins, each one twisted into grotesque poses. They surrounded a central figure, a man, or what remained of one. His eyes were hollow sockets and his face was twisted in eternal agony. The smell of decay was overpowering, and I gagged, my stomach churning with revulsion. The figure's mouth moved, emitting a sound that was half a moan, half a growl. You shouldn't have come here. It rasped the words echoing in the confined space. Now you're one of us. The mannequins began to move, their limbs creaking as they advanced towards me. I backed away only to feel cold hands grip my arms, my legs pulling me down. The attic seemed to close in, the walls pressing against me, the ceiling lowering. Please let me go, I begged, tears streaming down my face. But the darkness was relentless, suffocating. The figure in the center reached out, its hands skeletal and decayed, touching my face. A cold, burning sensation spread through me, and I screamed, the sound tearing from my throat. And then, the lights went out, and my scream was swallowed by the darkness. The night began like any other, with a chill creeping into my bones as the sun dipped below the horizon. I arrived at the old secluded cabin that I had rented for a weekend getaway hoping to escape the stress of city life. The cabin stood alone in the dense forest, its wooden structure groaning with the weight of time. The nearest town was miles away, and the only sounds were the whispers of the wind through the trees and the distant hoot of an owl. As I unlocked the door and stepped inside, a sense of unease washed over me. The interior was dimly lit, with shadows dancing on the walls as the flickering fireplace struggled to keep the darkness at bay. The cabin smelled of old wood and damp earth, a scent that was oddly comforting yet unsettling at the same time. I placed my bags down and took a deep breath, trying to shake off the feeling of being watched. Exploring the cabin, I noticed several old photographs hanging on the walls, depicting stern-faced people from a bygone era. Their eyes seemed to follow me as I moved from room to room, their expressions frozen in time. I couldn't help but feel that there was something off about this place, something that the previous tenants had left behind. But I brushed it off, attributing it to my overactive imagination. As night fell, 
The forest outside became an impenetrable wall of darkness. The only light came from the full moon, casting eerie shadows that seemed to writhe and twist with a life of their own. I settled into the old armchair by the fireplace, trying to lose myself in a book. But every creak of the floorboards, every rustle of leaves outside, made my heart race. The cabin felt alive, as if it were breathing, watching, waiting. Suddenly, I heard a faint tapping on the window. My heart leaped into my throat as I turned to look. There, just outside the glass, was the pale, gaunt face of a man. His eyes were hollow, and his lips were twisted into a sinister smile. I blinked and he was gone, leaving only the frosty imprint of his face on the window pane. I tried to convince myself that it was just a trick of the light, a figment of my imagination, but deep down, I knew something was terribly wrong. I decided to head to bed, hoping that sleep would bring some relief from the growing sense of dread. The bedroom was small and sparsely furnished, with an old wrought iron bed that creaked with every movement. As I lay there staring at the ceiling, I couldn't shake the feeling that I wasn't alone. The silence was oppressive, pressing down on me like a physical weight. Just as I was drifting off to sleep, I heard it. A soft, almost imperceptible whisper coming from the corner of the room. I sat up, my heart pounding in my chest. The whisper grew louder, more insistent, but I couldn't make out the words. It sounded like a voice from beyond, calling out to me, pleading with me. I turned on the bedside lamp, but the corner was empty. The whisper stopped, leaving only an eerie silence in its wake. I lay back down, pulling the covers up to my chin. My mind raced with thoughts of ghosts and spirits, of the restless dead. I tried to convince myself that it was just the wind, that my mind was playing tricks on me. But deep down, I knew that the night was far from over, and that the real horror was yet to come. Morning arrived with a reluctant slowness, the sun's weak rays barely penetrating the thick canopy of trees surrounding the cabin. I had slept fitfully, plagued by nightmares of faceless figures and shadowy beings lurking just out of sight. My body felt heavy, weighed down by the oppressive atmosphere of the cabin. I decided to explore the area, hoping that some fresh air would clear my head and dispel the lingering sense of dread. The forest was dense and silent, with only the occasional rustle of leaves and distant bird calls breaking the stillness. As I walked, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. Every snap of a twig, every rustle of leaves sent shivers down my spine. I kept glancing over my shoulder, expecting to see someone, or something, following me. But there was nothing there, only the silent, brooding trees. After a while, I stumbled upon an old, overgrown cemetery. The headstones were worn and weathered, their inscriptions barely legible. Some had toppled over, while others leaned precariously, as if about to fall. A chill ran down my spine as I realized how close this place was to the cabin. I felt an inexplicable urge to leave, to put as much distance between myself and the cemetery as possible. As I turned to go, I heard a soft, mournful wail carried on the wind. It sounded like a woman crying, her voice filled with sorrow and despair. I stopped in my tracks, my heart pounding in my chest. The cry grew louder, more desperate, and I felt a cold hand clutch at my heart. I wanted to run, but my feet felt rooted to the ground. The crying seemed to come from all around me, echoing through the trees. Finally, I managed to break free from the grip of fear and hurried back to the cabin. The crying faded as I put distance between myself and the cemetery, but the sense of unease lingered. When I reached the cabin, I found the door slightly ajar. I was certain I had closed it before leaving. My hands trembled as I pushed it open and stepped inside. The cabin was exactly as I had left it, but the atmosphere felt different, heavier. I couldn't shake the feeling that someone, or something, had been here in my absence. I checked every room, every corner, but found nothing out of place. Yet the sense of being watched persisted, growing stronger with each passing moment. I decided to distract myself with some chores, hoping that keeping busy would help calm my nerves. As I was sweeping the floor, I noticed a small, ornate box tucked away in a corner. It was covered in dust, as if it had been there for years. 
curiosity got the better of me, and I opened it. Inside was a collection of old photographs and letters, their edges yellowed with age. The photographs were of the same stern-faced people from the pictures on the walls. One photograph, in particular, caught my eye. A family portrait, with a man, a woman, and a young girl standing in front of the cabin. The man and woman had the same hollow eyes and twisted smiles as the figure I had seen at the window. The girl's face was blank, her eyes staring vacantly into the distance. I turned my attention to the letters, hoping to find some explanation for the unsettling atmosphere of the cabin. The handwriting was elegant but difficult to read. The ink faded and smudged. As I read, a chill ran down my spine. The letter spoke of strange occurrences, of voices in the night and shadows that moved on their own. The writers described a growing sense of dread, of feeling watched, of being haunted by unseen presences. One letter, dated several decades ago, ended with a desperate plea. If you find this, leave while you still can. This place is cursed, and those who stay are never truly alone. The words sent a shiver down my spine, confirming my worst fears. I realized that whatever haunted this place had not left, and that I was now caught in its sinister web. That night, the cabin seemed to come alive with a malevolent energy. The wind howled outside, rattling the windows and making the old wooden structure creak and groan. I tried to distract myself with a movie, but the shadows cast by the flickering screen seemed to dance and twist with an eerie life of their own. Every noise made me jump, my nerves frayed to the breaking point. As I lay in bed, the whispering started again. This time it was louder, more insistent, like a chorus of voices speaking in unison. They were coming from all around me, filling the room with their eerie chant. I pulled the covers over my head, trying to block out the sound, but it was no use. The voices grew louder, more frantic, until they seemed to be shouting. Suddenly, the whispering stopped, replaced by a deafening silence. I peeked out from under the covers, my heart pounding in my chest. The room was dark, the only light coming from the sliver of moonlight filtering through the window. I lay there, frozen with fear, straining to hear any sound. Then I felt it, a cold breath on the back of my neck. I whipped around, but there was no one there. My heart raced as I scanned the room, but I was alone. I tried to convince myself that it was just my imagination, but deep down, I knew that something was terribly wrong. I lay back down, my body tense and my mind racing with thoughts of ghosts and spirits. Just as I was drifting off to sleep, I heard a soft scratching at the door. It was faint at first, but it grew louder, more insistent, like something was trying to claw its way inside. I sat up, my heart pounding in my chest. The scratching continued, growing louder and more frantic. I couldn't bring myself to open the door, too terrified of what I might find on the other side. The scratching stopped abruptly, replaced by a low guttural growl. My blood ran cold as I realized that whatever was outside the door was not human. The growling grew louder, more menacing, and I could hear the sound of something heavy shuffling outside. I grabbed the nearest object, a heavy lamp, and braced myself for whatever was coming. The growling stopped suddenly, replaced by a deafening silence. I stood there, my heart pounding in my chest, waiting for something to happen but there was nothing, only the oppressive silence. I slowly opened the door, my hands trembling with fear. The hallway was empty, the only sound the creak of the floorboards under my feet. And I spent the rest of the night sitting in the armchair by the fireplace, too afraid to sleep. The shadows seemed to close in around me, the flickering light casting eerie shapes on the walls. I could feel the presence of the cabin watching me, waiting. I knew that whatever haunted this place was not done with me yet. The following day I resolved to leave the cabin. I couldn't take another night of terror and sleeplessness. As I packed my bags, I noticed the front door was slightly ajar again. My heart skipped a beat as I approached it, half expecting to see the gaunt figure standing outside. But there was no one there, only the silent, brooding forest. I stepped outside, my eyes scanning the tree line for any signs of movement. The air was thick with tension, and I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. As I made my way to my car, I heard a rustling in the bushes behind me. I turned, my heart pounding in my chest, 
but there was nothing there. I hurried to the car, my hands shaking as I fumbled with the keys. Just as I was about to get in, I felt a sharp pain in my leg. I looked down to see a dark figure standing behind me, a knife in his hand. He had stabbed me, the blade buried deep in my flesh. I screamed in pain, falling to the ground as blood poured from the wound. The figure stood over me, his hollow eyes filled with malice. I tried to crawl away, but my leg was useless, the pain unbearable. The figure bent down, his face inches from mine. He whispered something in a language I couldn't understand, his breath cold against my skin. Then he stood up and walked away, leaving me bleeding on the ground. I watched him disappear into the forest, his sinister laughter echoing in the night. I managed to drag myself back to the cabin, leaving a trail of blood behind me. The pain was excruciating, but I couldn't give up. I had to find a way to stop the bleeding, to survive until help arrived. I tore a piece of fabric from my shirt and tied it around my leg, trying to staunch the flow of blood. The cabin felt even more oppressive now, the shadows closing in around me. I crawled to the phone, my hands trembling as I dialed 911. The operator's voice was calm and reassuring, but I could barely focus on what she was saying. I told her about the intruder, about the stabbing, about the cabin. She promised that help was on the way, but I couldn't shake the feeling that it was already too late. As I waited for the police to arrive, the cabin seemed to close in around me. The walls felt like they were breathing, the shadows dancing with a life of their own. I could hear the whispering again, louder and more insistent, filling the room with its eerie chant. I knew that whatever haunted this place was not done with me yet. The pain in my leg was unbearable, and I could feel myself growing weaker by the minute. I tried to stay awake, to keep my focus, but the darkness was closing in. I could hear the intruder's laughter, echoing in my mind, taunting me. I knew that I had to do something to face him, to end this nightmare once and for all. I grabbed the nearest weapon I could find, a heavy candlestick, and made my way to the front door. The pain in my leg was excruciating, but I forced myself to keep going. I opened the door, my heart pounding in my chest, and stepped outside. The forest was silent, the only sound the rustle of leaves in the wind. I called out to the intruder, my voice echoing through the trees. Show yourself, I shouted, my voice trembling with fear and anger. I know you're out there. For a moment there was nothing but silence. Then I heard the faint sound of footsteps approaching. The intruder stepped out of the shadows, his hollow eyes fixed on mine. He smiled, a twisted, sinister grin that sent chills down my spine. I raised the candlestick ready to defend myself, but he just stood there watching me. He didn't answer, just continued to smile that twisted smile. I could feel the darkness closing in around me, the whispering growing louder. I knew that I had to end this, to stop him before it was too late. With all the strength I could muster, I lunged at him, swinging the candlestick with all my might. But he was too quick, dodging my attack with ease. He grabbed me by the throat, his grip like iron, and lifted me off the ground. I struggled, gasping for breath, but he was too strong. Just as I was about to lose consciousness, I heard the sound of sirens in the distance. The intruder hesitated, his grip loosening just enough for me to break free. I fell to the ground, gasping for air, as the sound of the sirens grew louder. The intruder's face twisted with anger as he heard the approaching sirens. He glared at me, his eyes filled with a burning hatred. I knew that I had to keep him distracted, to buy myself some time until the police arrived. I scrambled to my feet, my leg throbbing with pain, and grabbed the candlestick again. Stay away from me, I shouted, my voice filled with desperation. The police are coming, it's over. He laughed, a cold, hollow sound that sent chills down my spine. It's never over, he said, his voice a low, menacing whisper. Not until I say it is. With that, he lunged at me, his knife gleaming in the moonlight. I swung the candlestick, but he was too fast, dodging my attack and slashing at me with the blade. I felt a searing pain as the knife cut into my arm, blood streaming down my sleeve. I staggered back my vision blurring with pain and fear. The intruder advanced, his eyes filled with a manic gleam. I could hear the police sirens getting closer, but I knew that they wouldn't arrive in time. I had to find a way to stop him, to survive. 
I backed into the cabin using the furniture as a barrier between us, trying to keep him at bay. He followed me, his movements slow and deliberate, like a predator stalking its prey. I could feel my strength waning, the pain and blood loss taking their toll. I knew that I couldn't keep this up much longer. Desperation gave me a burst of energy, and I grabbed a heavy chair, swinging it at him with all my might. The chair connected, sending him crashing to the floor. I didn't waste a second, grabbing the knife from his hand and pinning him down. It's over, I said, my voice trembling with fear and determination. You're not going to hurt anyone else. The intruder struggled beneath me, his eyes filled with rage. You think you've won? He spat, his voice filled with venom. This isn't over. It will never be over. I pressed the knife against his throat, my hands shaking with fear and exhaustion. You're done, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. You're not going to hurt anyone else. The sound of the police sirens grew louder, the flashing lights visible through the trees. The intruder's eyes darted to the window, and for the first time I saw fear in his eyes. He knew that his time was up. He made one last desperate attempt to break free, but I held him down, using every ounce of strength I had left. The front door burst open, and the police stormed in, their guns drawn. Drop the knife, one of them shouted, their voices filled with urgency. I did as they said, letting the knife clatter to the floor. The intruder was quickly restrained and handcuffed, his sinister laughter echoing through the cabin as they led him away. I collapsed to the floor, my body trembling with relief and exhaustion. The paramedics rushed in, tending to my wounds and checking my vitals. The pain was overwhelming, but I knew that I was safe now, that the nightmare was finally over. As they helped me to my feet and led me outside, I glanced back at the cabin one last time. The shadows seemed to retreat, the oppressive atmosphere lifting. I could feel the presence of the trapped souls, finally at peace. I knew that I had done the right thing, that I had ended the curse and freed them from their torment. The days that followed were a blur of hospital visits and police interviews. I recounted my story over and over, trying to make sense of the events that had transpired. The intruder was identified as a local man with a history of mental illness and violence. He had been living in the woods, preying on unsuspecting visitors to the cabin. The police assured me that. The police assured me that he would be locked away for a long time, and that I had nothing more to fear. But even in the safety of the hospital, the memories of that night haunted me. The sinister laughter, the whispering voices, and the gaunt figure's hollow eyes replayed in my mind, a constant reminder of the horror I had faced. I spent several days in the hospital recovering from my injuries. The stab wound in my leg required stitches, and the cut on my arm was bandaged tightly. The doctors were optimistic about my physical recovery, but the psychological scars would take much longer to heal. Friends and family visited, offering their support and comfort, but it was difficult to shake the feeling of dread that lingered within me. Once I was discharged, I returned to my apartment in the city. The familiar surroundings provided some comfort, but the nights were still filled with nightmares. I would wake up in a cold sweat, the sound of the intruder's laughter echoing in my ears. I found solace in counseling, slowly piecing together the shattered fragments of my psyche. One evening, as I sat by the window, watching the city lights twinkle in the distance, I thought about the cabin and the trapped souls I had encountered. I felt a strange connection to them, as if their torment had become a part of my own story. I knew that I couldn't fully move on until I understood more about what had happened. I returned to the town near the cabin, this time during the day. The sun was shining, casting a warm, reassuring light over the landscape. I visited the local library again, digging deeper into the history of the cabin and its previous inhabitants. The more I learned, the more I realized how deeply the curse had affected everyone who had come into contact with that place. I discovered that the family in the photograph, the man, woman, and young girl, had disappeared under mysterious circumstances. The man, it turned out, had been driven mad by the voices and visions that haunted the cabin, much like the intruder who had attacked me. The woman and child had tried to flee, but their fates remained unknown. The locals whispered about their restless spirits, forever bound to the cursed land. Armed with this new understanding, 
I decided to make one final trip to the cabin. I needed to confront the place where it had all begun, to find closure and make peace with my past. As I approached the cabin, now abandoned and falling into disrepair, I felt a sense of calm wash over me. The oppressive atmosphere seemed to have lifted, the shadows less menacing in the light of day. I stood in the living room, the old record player silent and still. The memories of that fateful night flooded back, but I faced them with a newfound strength. I spoke aloud, my voice echoing through the empty rooms, addressing the spirits that had once tormented me. You are free now, I said, my voice steady. You can find peace. The curse is broken. As if in response, a gentle breeze rustled through the cabin, carrying with it a sense of tranquility. I knew that I had done all I could, that the spirits could finally rest. I turned to leave, a weight lifted from my shoulders. As I stepped outside, I heard the distant sound of police sirens. I realized that they must have been patrolling the area, keeping an eye out for any signs of trouble. But I knew that I didn't need their protection anymore. The nightmare was over, and I was ready to move on with my life. I took one last look at the cabin, now just a relic of the past. As I turned to walk away, I saw it, a shadowy figure standing at the edge of the forest. My heart skipped a beat as I recognized the gaunt, hollow-eyed man. He stepped into the moonlight, his sinister smile sending chills down my spine. His laughter echoed through the cabin, a haunting reminder of the horrors I had faced. I heard the cops, but it was too late. As I was looking out the window, I saw the shadow figure of the intruder who was walking into the moonlight and his laughter echoing within the room. The campfire crackled, sending sporadic bursts of sparks into the starless, oppressive night. Six friends huddled around the flickering flames, their faces painted with eerie shadows that danced grotesquely with each flicker of the fire. Deep in the heart of Blackwood Forest, miles from civilization, they shared stories to stave off the creeping chill and the unsettling feeling of being watched. Marcus, the self-proclaimed bravest, leaned in closer to the fire, his eyes glinting with mischief. I've got a story for you all, he said, his voice dropping to a conspiratorial whisper. It's about the Blood Moon Killer. The others groaned, but there was a palpable tension in the air. Marcus had a knack for spinning tails that sent shivers down spines, and tonight the atmosphere seemed primed for horror. Legend has it, Marcus began, his voice low and sinister, that during a blood moon, a deranged killer roams these very woods, hunting for campers. They say he's a man who lost his mind after his family disappeared here decades ago. No one knows his name, but they call him the Shadow Stalker because he blends into the darkness, unseen until it's too late. They say he wears the faces of his victims. Nice try, Marcus, said Emma, rolling her eyes, though her voice trembled slightly. But we're not kids anymore. Marcus shrugged, a sly smile playing on his lips. Believe what you want. But remember, tonight is a blood moon. The friends laughed nervously, but unease settled over them like a heavy fog. As the night wore on, they retreated to their tents, the fire reduced to glowing embers. The forest was deathly silent, save for the occasional hoot of an owl or rustle of leaves. Just past midnight, Lucy awoke to a soft, rhythmic sound outside her tent, a distant thumping, like footsteps. She held her breath, listening intently. The sound grew louder, closer, until it seemed just outside. Her heart pounded in her chest, every instinct screaming to stay still, stay quiet, the tent zipper moved, slowly, deliberately. Lucy's eyes widened in terror. She stifled a scream as a shadow fell across her face. The tent flap opened, revealing nothing. No one stood there. Trembling, she peered out into the darkness but saw only the faint outlines of trees against the dim light of the moon. She crawled out of her tent, clutching a flashlight. Guys, she whispered, but there was no response. Lucy crept toward the other tents, shining her light into each one. Empty. Panic surged through her. Where had everyone gone? Suddenly, a blood-curdling scream shattered the silence. 
It came from deep within the woods. Lucy's flashlight flickered, then went out, plunging her into darkness. She stumbled back, her breath coming in ragged gasps. She felt the suffocating presence of the forest closing in around her. From the corner of her eye, she saw a movement, a figure standing just beyond the tree line, shrouded in shadow. Heart racing, she turned to run, but tripped over a gnarled root, falling hard. The figure approached, silent and menacing, a glint of steel in its hand, and something else, something that glistened wetly in the moonlight. Lucy scrambled to her feet and sprinted blindly through the forest, branches tearing at her clothes and skin. The figure pursued her, always just out of sight, but she could feel its presence closing in. She tripped again, this time landing near a shallow pit. In the dim light of the blood moon, she saw what lay inside. Bodies. Her friend's bodies twisted and lifeless, their faces contorted in terror, eyes staring blankly into the void. Their throats were slashed, and their blood had pooled, dark and glistening, in the pit. Lucy screamed, but the sound was swallowed by the forest. The figure loomed over her, raising its weapon. She closed her eyes, bracing for the end. The next day, a search party scoured Blackwood Forest, but no trace of the six friends was ever found. The tents were undisturbed, the campsite eerily pristine, as if they had simply vanished into thin air, and the bodies were never found. It was a well-deserved vacation with all the work at the office grinding me down to the bone. The constant hum of computers, the ceaseless ringing of phones, and the drudgery of endless meetings had taken their toll on my sanity. So, when my friend Mark suggested a camping trip deep into the wilderness, away from the chaos of urban life, I jumped at the opportunity. We packed our gear with excitement, eager for a weekend of serenity under the stars. The drive to the remote campsite was long, winding through dense forests and rugged terrain. As we drove deeper into the wilderness, the outside world seemed to fade away, replaced by the untouched beauty of nature. The isolation was both thrilling and unnerving, but we were determined to disconnect from the stresses of our everyday lives. As we arrived at the edge of the forest, the sun was setting, casting an orange glow over the dense trees. The light flickered through the branches, creating eerie shadows that danced on the forest floor. We set up our tents and started a fire, the crackling flames offering a semblance of safety against the encroaching darkness. Laughter filled the air as we shared stories and jokes, feeling the weight of our routines lifting. The forest was alive with sounds, the rustling of leaves, the distant call of an owl, the chirping of crickets. It felt surreal to be so far removed from civilization. As the night grew deeper, the sounds became more pronounced, more intimate, as if the forest itself was a living, breathing entity watching over us. The sense of tranquility was profound, and we soon drifted into a deep, dreamless sleep. In the early hours of the morning, a chill settled over the campsite. I awoke briefly, shivering, and noticed that the fire had died down to glowing embers. I wrapped myself tighter in my sleeping bag and glanced over at Mark, who was sound asleep. The forest seemed to whisper secrets in the dark, but exhaustion overtook me, and I fell back into a restless slumber. The first night was blissful. The sounds of nocturnal creatures and the rustling of leaves lulled us into a deep sleep. It felt good to be disconnected from the world, with only the crackling fire as our companion. The next morning, we hiked along the trails, soaking in the beauty of untouched nature. The air was crisp, the birds were singing, and everything seemed perfect. As we ventured deeper into the forest, we came across a small, serene lake. The water was still, reflecting the surrounding trees like a mirror. We decided to take a break and enjoy the peacefulness of the spot. Mark skipped stones across the water while I took in the scenery, feeling a rare sense of contentment. The beauty of the place was mesmerizing, a stark contrast to the bustling city life we had left behind. But as the day turned to dusk, an uneasy feeling started to creep in. The sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows that seemed to stretch and twist unnaturally. The forest, once inviting and calm, began to feel claustrophobic, its dense trees pressing in on us. It felt like we were being watched, but I shrugged it off as paranoia from the isolation. Mark seemed to sense it too, his eyes darting nervously around. We laughed nervously, trying to brush off the eerie sensation. 
That night, as we sat around the campfire, the feeling of unease grew stronger. The forest was too quiet, the usual sounds of wildlife conspicuously absent. We heard a noise, a twig snapping underfoot. Our laughter died instantly. We scanned the darkness but saw nothing. Mark joked that it was probably a deer, but his voice lacked conviction. We tried to resume our conversation, but the sense of being watched was overwhelming. Sleep came slowly that night. Every rustle, every whisper of wind, set my nerves on edge. In the dead of night, I thought I saw a shadow pass by the tent, but when I looked again, it was gone. I convinced myself it was a trick of the light, but deep down, I knew something was wrong. I lay awake for hours, listening to the sounds of the forest, my mind racing with irrational fears. In the early hours of the morning, just before dawn, I finally drifted off to sleep. My dreams were filled with twisted images and unsettling whispers, the kind that linger long after waking. When I finally opened my eyes, the sun was rising and I felt a sense of relief. The daylight brought with it a semblance of safety, but the memory of the night before lingered in my mind. On the second night, the feeling of being watched grew stronger. As we sat around the campfire sharing ghost stories, we heard a noise, a twig snapping underfoot. Our laughter died instantly. We scanned the darkness but saw nothing. Mark joked that it was probably a deer, but his voice lacked conviction. Sleep came slowly that night. Every rustle, every whisper of wind, set my nerves on edge. In the dead of night, I thought I saw a shadow pass by the tent. But when I looked again, it was gone. I convinced myself it was a trick of the light. But deep down, I knew something was wrong. The following morning, we decided to explore a new trail. The path was narrow and overgrown, leading us deeper into the forest. The further we went, the denser the trees became, blocking out the sunlight and creating an oppressive atmosphere. The sense of being watched was constant, a nagging presence that refused to leave. As we trekked through the underbrush, we came across an old, abandoned cabin. The windows were shattered, the door hanging off its hinges. Curiosity got the better of us, and we decided to take a closer look. Inside, the air was thick with dust and decay. Broken furniture and scattered belongings hinted at a life once lived, now forgotten. The walls were covered in strange, crude carvings that sent a shiver down my spine. That night, back at our campsite, the sense of dread was almost tangible. The firelight cast eerie shadows on the surrounding trees, and the forest seemed to close in around us. As we sat in silence, we heard it again, a twig snapping, closer this time. Mark's eyes widened with fear, and I knew he felt it too. We called out into the darkness, but only silence answered. Sleep was impossible. Every noise, every movement outside the tent set my heart racing. At one point, I could have sworn I heard footsteps circling our campsite. I lay there, paralyzed with fear, straining to hear anything beyond the pounding of my own heart. Hours passed in agonizing stillness until, finally, the first light of dawn broke through the trees, and I felt a wave of relief wash over me. The third day we discovered footprints around our campsite. They weren't ours. Panic set in. We decided to pack up and leave, but as we were dismantling our tents, we heard it again, a twig snapping, followed by a rustle. This time there was no mistaking it. Someone was out there watching us. Mark and I decided to confront whoever it was. We shouted into the trees, demanding they show themselves. Silence was the only response. The forest seemed to hold its breath, waiting for something to happen. As the sun dipped below the horizon, our fear grew palpable. That night, the forest was unnaturally quiet. The usual sounds of nocturnal creatures were absent, replaced by an oppressive silence that weighed heavily on us. We kept the fire burning bright, its light the only thing keeping the encroaching darkness at bay. The sense of being watched was stronger than ever, and every shadow seemed to move with a life of its own. As we sat around the fire, we heard the unmistakable sound of footsteps approaching. Slow, deliberate, unhurried. My heart pounded in my chest as I unzipped the tent and peered into the darkness. A figure stood at the edge of the clearing shrouded in shadows. The flickering firelight revealed only glimpses. A tall, imposing silhouette, 
eyes glinting with malevolence. Before I could react, the figure lunged. Mark screamed as the intruder slashed at him with a knife. I rushed forward, tackling the attacker, but he was strong, too strong. He threw me off with ease, and I landed hard on the ground. The wind knocked out of me. Desperation fueled me as I scrambled to my feet. Mark was bleeding, his face contorted in pain. I grabbed a branch and swung it at the attacker, hitting him square in the side. He grunted and stumbled, giving me enough time to drag Mark to his feet. We ran blindly into the forest, our only thought to escape. We ran through the forest, our footsteps pounding against the forest floor. Branches whipped at our faces, the underbrush tearing at our clothes. Mark was slowing down, his injuries sapping his strength. I could hear the attacker behind us, relentless in his pursuit. The forest that had seemed so beautiful now felt like a prison, its shadows hiding dangers we couldn't see. As we fled, the forest grew darker and more oppressive. The trees seemed to close in around us, their gnarled branches reaching out like skeletal fingers. Every snap of a twig, every rustle of leaves sent a jolt of fear through me. I glanced back and saw the figure still following, moving with an unnerving grace and speed. We stumbled upon an old, overgrown path that seemed to lead deeper into the woods. With no other options, we followed it, hoping it would lead us to safety. The path twisted and turned, leading us through dense thickets and across shallow streams. The sounds of our pursuer grew fainter, but the sense of dread never left. Mark's condition was worsening. He was pale and sweating, his breaths coming in ragged gasps. I knew we needed to find help soon, but the forest seemed endless, and there was no sign of civilization. The path led us to a clearing, and we collapsed, exhausted and terrified. The moon cast an eerie light over the scene, creating long, menacing shadows. As we tried to catch our breath, we heard the footsteps again, closer this time. The figure emerged from the trees, his cold eyes fixed on us. He moved with a predatory grace, a smile playing at the corners of his mouth. He seemed to take pleasure in our fear, savoring the moment. I stood over Mark, clutching the branch, my only weapon. The attacker circled us, his eyes never leaving mine. He spoke in a low, menacing voice, his words sending chills down my spine. You can't escape, he whispered, his voice a rasp that seemed to echo in the darkness. I swung the branch wildly, but he was too fast. He dodged my blows effortlessly, taunting me with his agility. With a swift motion, he disarmed me, the branch clattering to the ground. Desperation fueled me as I scrambled to my feet, Mark was bleeding, his face contorted in pain. I grabbed a branch and swung it at the attacker, hitting him square in the side. He grunted and stumbled, giving me enough time to drag Mark to his feet. We ran blindly into the forest, our only thought to escape. Branches whipped at our faces, the underbrush tearing at our clothes. Mark was slowing down, his injuries sapping his strength. I could hear the attacker behind us, relentless in his pursuit. The forest that had seemed so beautiful now felt like a prison, its shadows hiding dangers we couldn't see. We stumbled into a small clearing, gasping for breath. Mark collapsed, unable to go any further. I stood over him, clutching the branch, my only weapon. The attacker emerged from the darkness, his cold eyes fixed on us. He moved with a predatory grace, a smile playing at the corners of his mouth. I swung the branch wildly, but he was too fast. He dodged my blows effortlessly, taunting me with his agility. With a swift motion, he disarmed me, the branch clattering to the ground. I stood defenseless, my heart pounding in my chest. Mark was slipping into unconsciousness, his breathing shallow. I knew we had to keep moving, but my legs felt like lead. The attacker advanced slowly, savoring our terror. I grabbed Mark's arm and tried to drag him, but he was too heavy. I could feel the tears streaming down my face the hopelessness of our situation crashing down on me. The attacker stopped a few feet away, his eyes glinting with malice. This is the end, he said softly, raising his knife. I braced myself for the inevitable, my mind racing with thoughts of escape. But there was no way out, no way to fight back. The forest, once a place of beauty and serenity, had become our tomb. The attacker lunged at me, his knife glinting in the moonlight. I dodged to the side, narrowly avoiding the blade. Desperation and fear fueled my movements, giving me a burst of strength. 
I grabbed a rock from the ground and hurled it at him, hitting him square in the chest. He staggered back, giving me a momentary advantage. I grabbed Mark, pulling him to his feet. We stumbled through the forest, our breaths coming in ragged gasps. The attacker was right behind us, relentless in his pursuit. The forest seemed to close in around us, the trees whispering threats in the darkness. Every step felt like a struggle, the weight of fear dragging us down. We came to a ravine, its steep walls rising on either side. There was no way to cross, no way to escape. I turned to face the attacker, my heart pounding in my chest. He stood at the edge of the clearing, his eyes gleaming with malice. He moved slowly, deliberately, savoring our terror. I grabbed a large branch and held it out in front of me, ready to defend myself. The attacker laughed, a low, menacing sound that sent chills down my spine. You think you can stop me? He taunted, advancing slowly. I swung the branch, but he caught it easily, wrenching it from my grasp. He shoved me to the ground, the impact knocking the wind out of me. I struggled to my feet, but he was too fast. He grabbed me by the throat, lifting me off the ground. His eyes were cold, devoid of any humanity. This is where it ends, he whispered, his grip tightening. I kicked and struggled, but his hold was unbreakable. My vision blurred, darkness closing in. Just as I was about to lose consciousness, Mark lunged at him, tackling him to the ground. They struggled, the knife glinting in the moonlight. I scrambled to my feet, my heart pounding. I had to help Mark, had to save us. We heard a branch crack behind us, and before we could react, Mark fell on me and I could feel the hot and warm blood of his body. When I looked up, I only remember seeing the cold and dark eyes of the person hunting us down. His smile widened as he raised his knife, and I knew then that our escape had been a futile dream. Growing up, I always heard whispers about the man in the mirror. It was one of those urban legends parents told their kids to keep them from staying up late. The legend said that if you looked into a mirror at midnight and chanted his name three times, the man in the mirror would appear and reveal your darkest fears. I never believed it, of course. That is, until the night I decided to put the legend to the test. It was the eve of my 21st birthday, and I was home alone. My parents were out of town, and my friends had bailed on our planned celebration. Feeling restless and a bit rebellious, I remembered the old legend. Midnight was approaching, and with a mix of skepticism and curiosity, I stood in front of the mirror in my bedroom. As the clock struck twelve, I stared at my reflection and whispered, Man in the mirror, man in the mirror, man in the mirror. I felt a chill run down my spine as soon as the words left my lips. The room grew colder, and my breath fogged up the glass. For a moment, nothing happened. I let out a nervous laugh, feeling silly for believing in such nonsense. But then, my reflection began to distort. The face in the mirror was no longer mine. It twisted and morphed, taking on the features of a gaunt pale man with hollow eyes and a sinister grin. Do you wish to see your darkest fear? He whispered, his voice echoing around the room. I tried to back away, but my feet were glued to the floor. The mirror's surface rippled like water, and the room around me faded away. I was standing in a dark, endless void, and the man in the mirror was now standing in front of me, his cold, bony fingers reaching out to touch my face. Suddenly, scenes from my past started flashing before my eyes. My childhood nightmares, the bullies at school, the accidents I had narrowly escaped. But then the visions changed. I saw my loved ones in danger, suffering because of me. My parents, my friends. They were all crying out for help, trapped in nightmarish situations that I couldn't rescue them from. Stop! I screamed, but the man in the mirror only laughed his eyes gleaming with sadistic pleasure. The scenes grew more horrifying with each passing second, each one more vivid and real than the last. And I, just when I thought I couldn't take it anymore, everything went black. I found myself back in my room, the mirror reflecting only my pale, terrified face. The man in the mirror was gone, but his final words lingered in the air. Remember, I will always be watching. Next time, you might not be so lucky. From that night on, I couldn't look at a mirror without feeling a cold shiver run down my spine. I avoided them as much as possible, but sometimes, out of the corner of my eye, I swear I can still see his sinister grin. 
Every time I turned off the lights and closed my eyes, I would hear faint whispers coming from the darkness. The words were indistinct, but filled with malice, and they seemed to come from every direction at once. Sleep became a fleeting memory, as nights turned into an endless series of jolts and cold sweats. One night, a few weeks after the encounter, I awoke to a strange sensation. The room was plunged in pitch-black darkness, but there was a palpable presence, a weight pressing down on my chest. I could feel icy fingers brushing against my skin. Panic seized me as I fumbled for the lamp beside my bed. When the light finally flickered on, the room was empty. But in the mirror I saw him, standing just behind me, grinning. I tore the mirror from the wall, smashing it into pieces. My heart pounded as shards of glass scattered across the floor. But even then, I could see fragments of his face in each jagged piece, all of them watching me, taunting me. I covered the shards with a blanket and spent the rest of the night sitting against the wall, clutching a baseball bat. The days became a blur. I avoided reflective surfaces, growing more paranoid with each passing hour. My friends noticed the change, but I couldn't bring myself to explain. How could I tell them that a mythical figure was haunting my every waking moment? They would think I had lost my mind. Then, one particularly dark and stormy night, the power went out. I sat alone in the darkness, the rain hammering against the windows. I tried to calm my racing heart, but the silence was oppressive. I lit a candle and watched the shadows dance across the walls, each one a potential hiding place for the man in the mirror. A soft, almost imperceptible whisper broke the silence. You can't hide from me. The voice was so close, it felt as though it was coming from inside my head. My eyes darted around the room, but there was nothing there. Yet the feeling of being watched grew stronger. I decided to leave the house, desperate for fresh air and a change of scenery. I ran out into the storm, the rain soaking me to the bone. But even outside, I could feel his presence. Every window I passed reflected his face, every puddle held his eyes. There was no escape. I wandered aimlessly until I found myself at an old abandoned church on the outskirts of town. Seeking refuge, I pushed open the heavy wooden doors and stepped inside. The air was thick with dust and the smell of decay, but it felt safer than being outside. As I explored the dark, empty corridors, I stumbled upon an old, cracked mirror. Despite my better judgment, I couldn't help but approach it. My reflection was distorted by the damage. But there he was, clearer than ever, standing right behind me. Welcome to my world, he whispered, his voice sending shivers down my spine. I turned to run, but the door slammed shut with a deafening bang. The temperature dropped rapidly, and I could see my breath misting in front of me. The man in the mirror stepped out of the glass his form becoming more solid with each step. He reached out, his fingers brushing against my cheek, leaving a trail of frostbite in their wake. You're mine now, he hissed, his eyes burning with a malevolent fire. I tried to scream, but no sound escaped my lips. I could feel my body growing numb, the cold spreading from his touch. My vision blurred, and the world around me started to fade. The last thing I saw was his face inches from mine his grin wider than ever. I woke up in my own bed, drenched in sweat and gasping for air. The room was as I had left it, with no sign of the man in the mirror. I wanted to believe it had all been a terrible nightmare, but the frostbite marks on my cheek told a different story. The whispers have grown louder since that night, and the feeling of being watched never goes away. Every reflection holds the threat of his return, and I can't escape the terror that has taken over my life. Now I sit in the darkness, waiting for midnight to strike again. I know he's coming for me, and this time I might not be able to escape. As the clock ticks closer to twelve, I can't shake the feeling that this is only the beginning. Ah. The legend never mentioned what happened if the man in the mirror took a liking to you. But now, I fear I'm about to find out. Thank you all for watching and for all the support that you are providing. How did you enjoy the campfire stories? Do let me know in the comment section. And now, the final touch. In the forest's gloom, where shadows dance, whispers weave a chilling trance. Camping neath the moon's cruel leer, echoes of dread draw near. Beneath the ancient gnarled trees, a terror lurks, a fiendish tease. 
Eyes that gleam with malice bright, haunting whispers in the night. Lost souls wander, cursed to roam in this dark and haunted home. Beware the woods where nightmares breed, lest you join the wretched doom to bleed. Have a good night's sleep, everyone. Oh, did you lock your doors tonight? Are you sure? Who knows, maybe someone or something might already be inside waiting for you.